Hi there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films, my name is Alan. Warfare has evolved constantly throughout human history, from tens of thousands of years ago when tribes of primitive man faced down other tribes over hunting grounds, to the terrible worldwide conflicts of the 20th century punctuated with the dropping of the first atomic bomb. As we become more advanced as a species, our weapons have become more terrifying and destructive, but we've also tried to invent rules to create some kind of order on the battlefield. Why aren't you shooting? You're not being shot at yet! How can you tell? A hit means it's close! From the codes of chivalry followed by feudal era knights, to the modern codes of conduct and rules of engagement adopted by armies on the 21st century battlefield. It's kind of a strange phenomenon if you think about it. War is the ultimate struggle where two sides are interlocked in a contest of trying to kill the other. The loser dies and the winner does not. It is in our most animalistic nature to do anything possible to survive a situation, and it's completely against our nature to restrain ourselves and deprive ourselves of any advantage that might extend our lives. But that is the beauty of our human society. We are constantly trying to fight our nature through reason, intellect, and morality. And one of the more recent developments in our history is the prevention of using child soldiers on the battlefield. In 2000, the UN General Assembly adopted the optional protocol to the Convention of the Rights of the Child on the Involvement of Children in Armed Conflict. This basically raises the minimal age for a conscription to the age of 18 and does not allow anyone younger than 16 to be recruited into a military and they cannot see combat until they are 18. Furthermore, the ICC considers the use of children under the age of 15 in combat as a war crime and will prosecute individuals responsible, which is a good step towards the right direction. But like most international law, having something written down on paper is very different from actually enforcing it. Today I want to ask you, the viewers, to be the judges and jurors of five examples of child soldier usage in fictional franchises. At the end of each one of these segments, we'll be putting a poll in the top right corner of the video that you guys can vote in. Since most of these fictional organizations are not ruled by some type of universal code or law, we'll be asking you to judge the morality of each organization's use of children in combat. Just like in real life, not all of these cases are black and white. We'll start off in familiar territory, the clone troopers of the Grand Army of the Republic. This was an entire military force made up of clones that were altered genetically to age twice as fast as a normal human being. This meant that at the age of nine, the clones were physically the size of 18-year-old adults and sent into combat. Now, there have been debates on whether this advanced aging also increased the maturity and mental development of the clones as well as their physical size. It should be noted that Jedi commanders who have fought alongside these clones have used the Force to sense them and have oftentimes compared their signature in the Force as something very close to a nine-year-old rather than an adult. It also should be noted that the Force is black magic and we usually don't use magic in these kind of comparison videos. One of the main issues with involving children in warfare is that they are not mentally prepared to understand combat and the things they must do in combat. Exposing a child to extreme violence and trauma can lead to severe emotional and development problems that can follow them throughout the rest of their lives. The clone troopers in the Republic military seem to be somewhat resilient to the stresses of combat and rarely develop PTSD or other combat-related mental illnesses. This could be something that is altered in their DNA, or perhaps it shows us that the clone troopers are mentally far more mature than your average nine-year-old child. In fact, the clones seem very well adjusted to combat and are constantly engaged in warfare with very little rotation off the front lines. In many ways, they are far better adjusted for combat than non-clones that are much older. The biggest ethical concern regarding the clones is probably not the fact that they are technically children, but the fact that they have been created solely to fight the wars of the Republic. The clones are clearly sentient beings, but are also technically enslaved by the Republic. They have no choice but to fight for the Grand Army of the Republic and have no other options in life. So how moral is the use of clone troopers by the Galactic Republic? Please disregard the fact that they are clones and just focus on the fact that they are technically only nine years old when they enter combat. In Ender's Game, the world is surprised by an alien invasion carried out by a technologically superior race known as the Formix. These terrifying ant-like aliens are controlled by a hive mind and are extremely efficient at harvesting worlds for resources. 
Humanity barely manages to push back their first invasion and quickly sets out to revamp their defense for what they see as an inevitable round two against the Formix. Judging by the amount of damage that just one Formix ship was able to do to Earth, Humanity realizes the next battle against the Formix must take place on their home world in order to preserve Earth and its many colonies. The invasion fleet was to be led by a group of Humanity's best and brightest officers who would command the fleet remotely by FTL communications. The international fleet set out across the planet looking for the smartest and most talented children on Earth and began training them as cadets from an extremely young age. One of the youngest cadets in this group of talented officers was under the age of five when he was recruited to the International Fleet School and just six when he was placed under command of a massive fleet of warships. Some of the other children, like Andrew Wigan, was 11 by the time he took over the entire human invasion fleet, and the oldest in the group were just teenagers by the time they destroyed the Formic homeworld. It was said that these saviors of humanity were chosen at such a young age because they had quicker reflexes and were more mentally flexible than adults. This seems to be a half-truth, though, because most people's reaction times and computing power peaks in their early 20s rather than in their early teens. The other more practical explanation why children are used is that children are far more gullible than adults. These children can be trained to be just as proficient as adults in war games and can also be tricked into believing that the actual battles they were leading are in fact war games and not real. This allows the child officers to take bigger risks and be far removed from the actual death and destruction that they are leading their soldiers into. Given the fact that the enemies of humanities in this case were a formidable hive mind species, it was determined that the humans needed every advantage possible in order to win the war. The commander of the battle school that would train these child officers would later be court-martialed after the war for his very unethical training program. The commander had exposed one of the best students, Andrew Wiggin, to a Hunger Games-like scenario in the school and purposely set him up to be in conflict with older and larger students. This was in order to test how mentally tough Andrew would be in a real combat situation, but ultimately led to the death of a fellow cadet. Despite all of this, the commander was still heralded as a hero of humanity and justly rewarded for his development of brilliant leaders like Andrew Wick. So how moral is the International Fleet's use of children as commanders in Ender's Game? Vote in the top right corner. In 1995, years before the return of Lord Voldemort, a group of students at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry started a secret organization dedicated to magical combat training. The students involved in this armed militia called themselves Dumbledore's Army and ranged in age from early teens to 18 years of age. Although Dumbledore's Army mainly focused on training its members in the defensive arts of magical combat and avoided more lethal killing spells, it was still an organization armed with wands and therefore could be labeled a paramilitary organization with political ties to the schoolmaster, Albus Dumbledore, who at the time was a fugitive and on the run from the Ministry of Magic. Dumbledore's army was a completely volunteer force, and although many of the children involved had no idea what they were getting into, they ultimately were involved in several magical skirmishes, including the very deadly Battle of Hogwarts, which led to the deaths of scores of wizards and witches and werewolves. Which American Ben would say is a great thing because he is completely terrified by witches and also gingers and clowns. An argument could be made on behalf of the members of Dumbledore's army that the Ministry of Magic and Hogwarts School had failed tremendously at protecting them from the dangers of the magical world, and they as volunteers took their own safety into their own hands and began training for purely defensive reasons. So how moral is Harry Potter's use of child soldiers in Dumbledore's army? Vote in the top right corner. In the world of Attack on Titan, well, at least in the first season, Humanity is overrun by a race of gigantic, terrifying titans that seek to devour everything in their paths. The only thing protecting what is left of humanity is a series of massive walls and its brave defenders. Aaron Yeager is a typical youth of the time. He had lost his mother to a titan attack when he was just 10 years old, and just two years later he joined the Cadet Corps and began training to become one of the defenders of humanity. There's probably some good reasons why children were taken into training at such a young age. The militarization of society was crucial at the time because of the existential threat that was the Titan invasion. A massive amount of resources were used to stop the Titans from wiping out what remained of humanity. There were also very limited professions for people to do. Life within the walls was relatively simple and primitive. For individuals like Aaron, joining the military was considered a pretty good path. 
Cadets like Aaron would spend the next two to three years training their bodies and minds for warfare and learn how to use equipment like the omnidirectional mobility gear. The mobility gear was what allowed humans to go up against the might of the titans who could grow up to several stories high and only had one real weak spot in the back of their necks. The mobility gear could also propel a human soldier into the air and it was preferable that the wearer of the gear was lighter so that they could move faster and use less fuel. Some of the best fighters like Captain Levi were actually quite small in size, therefore having young cadets like Aaron Yeager, who was only 15 when he first saw combat, was a pretty big advantage. The prospect of fighting a titan was also kind of terrifying and extremely risky, which is exactly the kind of thing a teenager raging with hormones and lacking life experience would enjoy doing. Please now vote on how moral you think the use of children within the Cadet Corps and Survey Corps in Attack on Titan is. We'll be ending our list with another organization that is quite familiar to all of us, the Jedi Order. What makes this organization far more interesting than all the other ones we have discussed is the fact that the Jedi are self-proclaimed guardians of the light side of the Force, aka guardians of morality and everything good in the galaxy. Yet, a quick look at their recruitment practices and we'll see some very troubling patterns and signs of abuses. The Jedi Order for tens of thousands of years have sent out recruiters across the galaxy to seek out Force-sensitive individuals. Depending on the era, these individuals that were recruited could be as young as newborns and also as old as middle-aged men and women. In the last millennia of the Jedi Order's existence, the organization actually adopted a policy of recruitment that meant that only newborns and infants could be accepted into the Order, unless there were some extraordinary circumstances surrounding a potential recruit, like the Chosen One, Anakin Skywalker. The reason they adopted this strategy was to ensure that the conditioning of their recruits would be complete and that the child would have no learned worldview or previous experiences outside of the Jedi Order. Basically, this made it a lot easier to brainwash and mold how their new recruits thought. To make matters worse, organizations like the Jedi would allow their younger members to engage in combat and dangerous missions based on their merits and not by their age. So it wasn't uncommon for Padawans and younglings that weren't even teenagers to be involved in life or death combat situations. During the Clone Wars, preteens and teens were routinely promoted to command positions and not only were they thrown into battle, but put into charge of other living beings in battle. The Jedi Order, having no oversight from the Republic government or other third-party institutions, were able to avoid scrutiny. So how moral do you think the Jedi Order is in their use of child soldiers? So there you have it guys, those are five organizations that have been accused of using child soldiers in combat. Now I'm very curious to see the results of these polls, so don't forget to vote after each one of these segments. As usual, thanks for joining us today. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button. My name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie, and you are the protagonist.